At Shelter Insurance, we've found that peace of mind offers some real advantages. That's why we work hard to make things easier for you. By sheltering your cars, by sheltering your home, by sheltering your toys, by sheltering your life. Peace of mind. Isn't that the best shelter there is? Shelter Insurance. We're your shield. We're your shelter. As shelter agent Mark Manning about shelter's competitive insurance rates. Ted Hall that joins us from White River Area Agency on Aging. You see the sign behind us, the Jackson County <laughs> Senior Life Center, Unity Health here in Newport. And uh, Mr. Ted Hall, it's always my pleasure to get to see you, sir. Hey, it's good to be in Newport, and uh, we are on a bright, sunshiny afternoon. Beautiful. And uh, we appreciate Unity, and we appreciate the work they do for uh, Jackson County. And uh, we appreciate uh, the care they take care of, not only our seniors, but all over this this area and then also uh, we just had the grass uh, all mold and old coach like me we kind of like that grass and just kind of kind of looked like it of course we're here at the, old at, at, at the old elementary school here so uh, we also want to appreciate the newport school district absolutely uh, they allowed us to uh, to uh, uh, use this facility and i think they watch over it a little bit but uh, we try to take care of it and so I think that's the part. So we've got all the public announcements uh, taken care of, David. So let's get down to let's business. Get down, let's, so let's get down and take care of seniors because, uh, David, we still uh, are looking for folks that might want to work for us and go into homes that can, uh, you know, they have flexible hours and the pay's pretty good. And uh, that way they can come and go. They can take their kids to school, pick up their kids after school or whatever, we just love for them to give us a call at 870-612-3000. That's, that's there in Little Rock. Little Rock. That's, that's there in Batesville. And uh, it's uh, important to give you that number because that's where my office is. I'll make sure they get to the right place uh, because we are looking for folks to work for us. So uh, anyway, that's, that's one of the things we want to cover today. Well, that and then, uh, you know, one of the most important things that you get this time of year, and it is that time of year for the Medicare Part D program, and yes. and, and, and people kind of get confused on what exactly that is, but and that's what we're here to try to talk a little bit about that and to inform seniors that we're, we're at that time where we got to possibly make a change and look at some things. Absolutely. Of course, this is the time of year that we do this. Of course, we work with seniors on these type of questions all the time because, you know, really, uh, we're the voice of this part of the Arkansas for the voice for seniors, but you're right. It is Part D time for uh, for our Medicaid uh, uh, our Medicare uh, people to come in and see us and readjust their their schedules as far as their prescription drugs and any other questions that they might have related to senior care. Well, and and the thing that we actually Linda and I went in and visited with Miss Peggy last year about and we had some questions and it was it was really you go in there and you give her a little information and and she just got right on top of it told us exactly what we needed right. to do and in each and every year you need to look at whether or not you w want to change some of your prescription sure. drug policies because drugs may go up they may be a, a different plan this year but it, anybody Anybody that's on Medicare needs to do this. Absolutely. And uh, Dave, let's just mention here, in Independence County, and of course we, we're still uh, got some numbers there dealing with the virus right now, so we're having to be cautious there, but they can make uh, an appointment by calling that number at 870-612-3000. They'll get them with the right, uh, right. folks to make, uh, make the appointment. And then here in Jackson County, we're going to do a, a, a particular day. That'll be Tuesday, November the 16th from 9 to 12 and then on Tuesdays they can call for an appointment right now okay but on the 16th uh, Tuesday the 16th of November from 9 to 12 they'll be in our offices and they can come and so you know we're we're telling everybody we still got to watch the virus and uh, it seems like the numbers continue to go down but in some of our counties it's still up there so anyway we're we're just being precaution, precautious about all that uh, because we want to take care of folks 
Yeah, and, and, and of course, our stand on anything, it's, it's, it's somebody's choice to whether or not they want to get that vaccine or not. But, I mean, Absolutely. obviously, the numbers speak for themselves. And, and, and Absolutely. You know, something we encourage. And, and we've covered that. We've encouraged that. And, uh, you know, it is an uh, individual choice, but we are encouraging as uh, really people throughout the whole state. And there continues to be an, uh, more and more people are getting the, the vaccination. So anyway, we hope people feel comfortable about, about that. You know, uh, we're all about good health. And we're about serving people. And that's the reason why we appreciate you all helping us get the word out. Uh, you, Miss Linda. I appreciate you, Mr. Ted Hall, and all the folks at White River Area Agency on Aging and all your locations in the 10-county area. Taking care of seniors is what we do, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. John Chadwell, the Executive Director of Newport Economic Development Commission, back to the program, and we get to visit each and every month. And uh, John, thanks for taking time on a Friday morning to uh, join us and uh, give us some information. Appreciate you, sir. We're glad to. Hey, uh, it's always good to tell people what's going on and what we're working on, and, and uh, there's lots of exciting things that are going on. Well, we've got three or four uh, things we need to uh, kind of share and give uh, updates and information. One of them being, we'll start with the uh, Tech Depot, because that's just right around the corner. Sure, the, the Tech Depot is right now operational. In fact, this week we've had uh, two different classes in it with 12, 15 people, so it, it's going pretty well. Um, and it, it's covering a wide range of topics. So we're pretty excited about how the classes are going in Tech Depot, but we're also ready for the, um, the new building. And everybody talks about the new building and, and when's it going to be, when's it going to be? And, you know, when you're working with a, a grant, those things take time and there's a process, but we've advertised for bids and we'll open bids on October 22nd. And if they come in the money, then construction will start immediately. If they're a little high, then we'll decide whether NEDC is going to throw a little extra money in or whether uh, we're going to, you know, rework it and rebid. But uh, hopefully we're all praying that it comes in in the money and we can just uh, start construction. It'll be exciting to see that starting and happening downtown. Um, and then right next to it is our outdoor Wi-Fi accessibility center. And we are working on the plans for that. So we're hoping construction on that will start about the same time and it'll make a real nice area there. And it'll be an opportunity where people can access uh, the internet from their car. We'll have some tables and picnic type tables out there where they can sit at the tables uh, and, uh, you know, do their schoolwork or, or apply for a job or file for unemployment or just, you know, read a book or something from the library uh, electronically. So we're pretty excited that this is going to be a good resource, a big resource for people to have, uh, you know, in town that, that may not have it. Uh, so there, those things are exciting things, um, and it's really it really kind of points out what you can do with partnerships, because both of those projects are partnership projects. Tech Depot is a partnership between the Newport Economic Development Commission, the uh, Arkansas Center for Data Science, and ASU Newport, and so those three partners, and really now the Downtown Revitalization Group, because uh, since they're a nonprofit, Microsoft was able to give them all of these licenses to train people on Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and all that for free. Awesome. So they're, they're like 400 bucks a year if you buy them, but we got 20 licenses free wow. uh, to use instead of having to pay. So those partners came together and made that work. And then the partnership between the NEDC, Seeds of Faith Church, Drive, and the library uh, acquired the property and got the grant. Uh, to put this outdoor Wi-Fi accessibility center in. So when we work together and we do partnerships, it just really makes things go better and, and gives us a lot of opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise. So we're pretty excited about those partnerships. Well, I do know the folks in Newport, Arkansas, if something needs to be done, we're going to get it done. We're going to find a way to get it done and partnering up together like that is one of the ways that we can do that. Uh, want to give an update on the uh, medical marijuana, the process of what's going on there, the uh, plant, but uh, Kind of tell us about the lawsuit a little bit about that. 
So one of the medical marijuana uh, companies left Newport after uh, we had worked to get them here. Now that the Newport Economic Development Commission did not put any incentive money in that project. There was no money from us into that project, but there were a lot of things done to help that project come across. There were private people who donated easements uh, to get utilities there. Uh, some of the utilities cut their price on extending utilities to the plant. Uh, the bond board sold the land at a below market rate uh, for uh, the, the project. And so we felt like the community had invested in that facility and then before they really get fully operational, they move it. And we didn't feel like that we didn't feel like that was the correct thing to do, uh, neither on the behalf of the new company that bought it or the old company that sold it. Both of them should have been bound by uh, what we had done to help get it here to keep those jobs here. So we filed one lawsuit uh, almost six months ago. And it's just going through the processes of discovery and all that kind of thing. Um, and that lawsuit uh, is underway. And that lawsuit asks for monetary uh, compensation um, and monetary compensation for the people who donated the easements to get them the price back, monetary compensation to get the full price for the land uh, that we should have gotten, uh, monetary compensation to pay anything that the utilities cut their price on so that they get their money back. And then they were supposed to put a percentage of their profits um, into nonprofit organizations. So we've asked for that money uh, to come back too. Um, and, and we think that ought to be something that they have to do from now on, even though they're in Pine Bluff, they have to send us a percentage of their profits to our nonprofits because they said they would. That's what the first lawsuit does. Um, the second lawsuit was just filed last week. And it's a lawsuit because in the deed for the property that we gave them, we said if they were not operational uh, within 24 months uh, of, or at the 24 month mark actually, of, build, of taking the property, um, then it would revert back to us with any improvements coming to us as well, which would right. mean the building. So they sold the property and got ready to move it two weeks before their 20, 24 months was up. Um, and so we, we maintain they were not operational because they never had sold anything right. on the market. Uh, now, had they started growing? Yes, but they hadn't sold anything by the time. So they did not have a operational medical marijuana plant at the time gotcha. that uh, they sold the plant and certainly didn't have it after 24 months. So our position is that the building and the land ought to revert back to the bond board. And then if it does, that becomes something we can market for economic development. And we actually have uh, two or three uh, parties that might be interested in that facility uh, should we get it back. So that lawsuit's been filed and, and we hope that uh, we will prevail. And it just, you know, it gets all in the legal system and you never know. Uh, it, it, a judge is going to have to rule what the word operational means. Right, you know? And so it, it could go either way, but we really feel, have a good feeling about the fact that we got, well, we got a good case to stand on. And so we're, we're hopeful that that'll revert back to us and we can put that building back to creating jobs for our, our community. Uh, so though that, that, that is something we do, you know, this is the second time we've sued a company who didn't live up to their obligations to the community. And it's not that we just want to go around suing companies, but we believe that if we in good faith, make an investment in a company, then the company in good faith ought to do what they promise to do. And if they're not going to, uh, then they ought to pay, pay for everything. Right. Um, and you know, even if we don't put money in it, there's time, there's energy, there's effort, there's all this stuff uh, that was given based on their promise to come and create jobs for our economy. And if they fail that promise, then they need to reimburse us for what, what we have done uh, in our, on our end. It's just, it's just basically a contract that they ought to honor. So. Um, one thing it's done is it's helped companies that look at us um, and talk to us know that that we're serious. So some of the shiftier, shadier companies probably won't even look at Newport now <laughs> because they're like, okay, those guys will sue you if you don't do what you say you'll do. You know? And yeah, if, there's right. a if there's a company out there that, that is faithful and they're honest and they're trying to do what they're supposed to do and you know we gave them a, a three-year deal to create let's say a hundred jobs. And after three years, they're at 60, 
you know, and they're working at it, but they hadn't gotten there. All they got to do is write us a letter, explain why, and ask for an extension. And we'll give them an extension because they're really trying to do what they said they do. But if, they, if, there's a, if there's a company that doesn't care, you know, they just, they know what they're supposed to do and they just don't care, then we're going to, we're going to exercise our right uh, to hold them responsible for that. And I think that's what we, I think that's what the citizens of Newport trust us to do with what we run this office on. They trust us to look out for their interests. And, and we're supposed to look out for the best interest of citizens of Newport. And that's why we filed two lawsuits. Quickly, we want to mention just a couple of other things. One of them is paving us some roads and we'll get into the big uh, uh, building that's uh, going out by the interstate. Talk a little bit about both of those. All right, so we have paved Van Dyke uh, Road and it's actually in Dia, part in Dias, part in the county, but it serves three of our major industries. It serves uh, Southwest Steel, Grangus, and Arkansas Steel, and it was in need of repair. So uh, we let the bid and we repaired that. Uh, we can do that since it serves the industries. Um, and then the county and Dias, city of Dias don't have to worry about trying to come up with the money to do it. We're able to do that to serve the industries. And we also did the same thing for Comet Boulevard, which goes to our industrial sites and our certified industrial site and serves the college's commercial driver training program and this building that we might recoup from the medical marijuana uh, lawsuit. So both of those were industrial roads we repaved that were really needed and they made a big difference. And then we had two great expansions uh, announced or uh, one of them was Helena Agri Enterprises is uh, doing a, a $2.5 million uh, expansion on their property. Uh, it's going to create pro uh, approximately half a dozen new jobs. And then Greenway uh, Equipment is doing a multi-million dollar new facility uh, in Newport. It's going to be their new dealership, John Deere dealership facility. It's going to be out on the interstate. Um, and it's going to be right one of the first things people see if they come from the south as they're coming in town. So really, as people come into town, either way, now they come by the two new car dealerships one way. They'll come by this John Deere dealership the other way. And it really will help improve the image of Newport from the from the interstate perspective. And, and I say interstate, several people may not know that that's future I-57. And a couple of years ago, it, it was made official in Congress that that was future I-57. And then once it's made official, they have about a decade to actually make it an interstate. Right. So it's it, it will, we know it will be an interstate. It's not, maybe it will be someday, but we know it will be. And now that it's an interstate and we've got some things out there like that. You know, we have the housing, uh, the housing that's created, been created out there. We've got the elementary school out there. So we're starting to see uh, that interstate quarter uh, give us some show pieces that help people see Newport, maybe in a different light than if they just pass by and don't see anything. Well, I'll say this much. Uh, I appreciate what you guys do down at NEDC and the uh, uh, Newport Chamber. I mean, uh, just, you guys do what's best for the, all the citizens of our community. We appreciate that. I see what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, uh, many thanks for you taking time to join us and the good things to talk about each and every month here. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time, John. Well, thanks. Newport's a great place to live. It's a great place to work. Uh, folks like you who, who, who love the town, they make all the difference in the world. And we, we have a great reputation as a community for working together, you know, and being a place where people work together. And that, that, that's really, that's really the way it needs to be. And it makes, it makes the job so much easier when everybody wants to work together. Indeed, my friend, John Chadwell, NEDC, the Newport Economic Development Commission in downtown Newport. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Vision Care in the new building at 1920 Malcolm Avenue in Newport. We've got a great show for you today. Let's go inside and talk with Dr. Gavin McDowell and take a look at the beautiful building. Hey, Doc. Hey, how you doing? How are you, sir? Good, Good. to see you, man. You as well. <laughs> you have a nice little uh, 
party pad here. I, I do. Uh, yeah. Later, we've got the staff behind us right here at Customized Vision Care at 1920 Malcolm Avenue, Newport. A beautiful building. We promised a tour of the building, so I'm about ready to go on the tour. Linda, just follow us uh, this way and just kind of, we're going to head this way. Come follow us. Boy, Doc, I'm impressed right here, man. It's Thank pretty you. neat stuff. It is it's quite a step up. It is. No great. doubt about that. Yeah. Doc, we're in the first room along the way as we go. We're kind of more streamlined to, as a patient to come in. We're at station to station to station. Where yes. are we here? Tell us, tell us what this is. This is our workup room, room pre-test room. Um, we basically get a ballpark idea of where your prescription is. We we'll also take a few measurements as far as pressure goes and some fancy visual words that I won't bore you with, but uh, <laughs> just some work, get some information from me uh, before they even step in the room for me. <laughs> hey, Doc, tell us what goes on in this room. Uh, this is one of the, the exam rooms where we check vision, we check uh, ocular health uh, inside and out, just basically get a good assessment of uh, what makes your eyes click for the day, so to speak. What they click, <laughs> what I hope they click, and I hope they're seeing. We're going to move on to the next yeah. station. Well, Doc, what do we have here? This is really just a carbon copy of the other room. We just do the same thing. This way we can have more patients set into the system or in this whole system for us to be more efficient. That, that way the patient has a perception that it's going much quicker for them. And, and it really does go very fast. We're going to go quick. Yeah. We're going to go quick. We appreciate you joining us, Customized Vision Care. And is this a carbon copy? Or is this, this is a carbon copy. This yeah. is a carbon copy. You've got a lot of these carbon copies got a lot going of on carbon here, do Yeah, tell me about this. Uh, same thing, vision and ocular health uh, check rooms. So if I were to come over and sit down and go, oh, that's when you bring this over. Yeah. I come over and I do it, I'll do it slowly on you this time. Okay, good. Normally I smack good. you right in the face yeah. with it. Oh, oh, yeah. E. <laughs> e. <laughs> e. <laughs> we're having fun at Customized Vision Care. <laughs> In Newport at 1920 Malcolm Avenue in a, a very brand new building, not a brand new building, but a, a building that has been refurbished to where it is brand new. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's basically new from top to bottom. Doc, uh, uh, a big investment here, and you invest uh, in the community, and uh, uh, one of the reasons you've hear, hear, been here a long, long time is because... Uh, uh, the people come. If, if you build it, people people will come. People will yeah. come, and, and they, they continue to come. And I love Newport because it reminds me so much of my hometown of Corning, which is an, just another small town. But once you get here and get settled, it's 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 like family. Let's go to the next room and we'll see what else goes on. This is where the magic happens. The magic <laughs> happens right here. It says Gavin T. McDowell. Yes, sir. O. Period. D. Period. What's all that stand for? Well, T's for trouble. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the O and D stands for... Yeah, okay, I can't say it on camera. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> oh, lots of credentials on the wall. Oh, look at all these. Oh, you can't, probably can't see them on the camera, but that's well, okay. We don't have to look at those. But tell me about Mickey Mouse here. Oh, that's the wife. This is, my wife's the CFO, so uh, she's a Disney nut. See if I never, you don't sat, look near I've never sat in a CFO chair before. You do not look near as cute as she does. No, but I, I feel him as important as she might feel being you, the CFO of customized yes. vision care. <laughs> this is one of the most sensitive pieces of equipment we have. This is actually an ERG and a VEP. And what, not to bore anybody with the, what that acronym stands for, this, is, this measures impulses of the brain. Wow. So whether you're, you've got a retinal problem, a, a nerve problem, or just a flat out poor vision problem, we can see if the brain, because the brain is what is actually uh, performing the process for you to see. Now doc, I gotta ask you this. Yep. And I want you to be truthful with me. I remember being in this, not this room, but over at the other place and going into that room and you went, ah, nothing there. And we went on to the next room. Yeah, so yeah. What, what was the deal there? What? It, it, I was just confirming why whenever I'd shine the light in your eye, it had, I'd have to have you put your fingers in your ears. That was all it was. We're to my vision care. Dr. Gavin McDowell, he is as crazy as the day is long in the summertime. We're moving on to the next room. Sure. And Doc, this is one of my favorites. I don't know what it is. Tell me what we would do here. <laughs> I've done this a hundred times. You stick something, you go here. And <laughs> what does is, this machine do? This is a retinal camera. Uh, it allows us to take pictures of the back of the eye. That way we can have, a, like if I take a picture today, then three years from now I can take another picture or three months from now I'll take another picture and have just to show progression of, of changes in the back of the eye and I can compare apples to apples. It's hard to remember exactly what the back of your eye looks like 
from one day to the next whenever I have so many patients come through. Oh, so absolutely. That just documents that. And then in the same room, we have a uh, uh, visual field analyzer. Um, this, I have two of these in the office, and there's a reason why. This is the slowest machine. Now, here's the, here's the upside. This is the fastest version of this type of test that exists. Is that, that's not the click machine. That's, the, that's cli the clicker. Oh, it's the one everybody remembers, too. It's like, yeah. oh, please don't make me do the click <laughs> game today. <laughs> click <laughs> this takes about 15 minutes for both eyes. Okay. The old version was 15 minutes per eye. Oh. So, yeah, we, we upgraded, but it still takes a while, so that way patients aren't waiting. I got this one and another one in the other room. I love the streamline of how everything just yeah. is one, one step to the other. And, and, and I'll talk about these machines because I've been in here a lot. I've actually been in here a lot. <laughs> and I've, I've done that click test, and it's, it's not my favorite test, but it's, I've had worse tests before. It is know? critical in, in a lot of the, the ocular impairments that people have. That one right there. We're, We're moving on with work. Dr. Gavin McDowell at Customized Vision Care in Newport. We just moved one room down <laughs> along our trailways to wherever we're going from here. <laughs> this looks like a bigger version of something. Oh, this is, the, you check both. Oh, what does this do? This tell is, me, tell it's me an OCT. And what this does, it basically does, I uh, think like an ultrasound. Okay. But it uses a laser instead of sound. And what it does, it allows me to look at different tissues at the back of the eye and do like a cross-sectional view. Instead of just looking, I can see tissue, well, I see. It'll show me tissue thicknesses and stuff that are deeper than into the into the back of the eye that can't be seen. So you put one, you yeah, one side for one eye, one eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. out of here, I didn't, yeah, I like it, I like it. I tell you, it's, a, it's amazing what you have to do. You know, it just seems like when you go to the doctor and you have a couple of tests, just the, the, the you know, but when you, when you go to a, 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 an optometrist, there's so many tests that you have to do because there's so many things that you're checking for. I right. mean, it's not a simple, it's not a simple procedure. It's no. not a five minute deal. No, no. And, and here's the thing the most patients expect when they, from the time they hit the door coming in to the time they leave, they're really expecting the whole thing to be like 30 minutes. It's longer we, than that. we really try to do that. And that's the reason we, I've designed this building to be in such the flow that it is. So that way, we cut this down and we make it as efficient as possible. That way we're meeting patient expectations. Yes, yes. Well, we got more stuff to show. Yeah, coming right up. All right, Doc, I want to get into the contact room because this yes. is where I like to go because I love to talk about the Guaranteed Contact Lens Success Program. Yeah. Now, tell me what that is. Tell, tell, our, tell our audience what that is. Okay, generally speaking, if, if you've ever been even slightly hesitant about, will, will contact lenses work for me? Well, there's an easy way to find out. You come in, we've got several different brands and several different parameters. We've got something in stock to fit most everybody to try. And we will try every single one of these brands and every type of fit that it takes until you are happy or you just give up. So, and if you never find a lens that you are comfortable with and you see as well as you should, you think you should see out of, you don't have to pay for a single lens ever. So. Hey, let me tell you what, guaranteed contact lens success program right here at Customized Vision Care. And that Lynn is going to take care of all yes. the contact needs. She will. We're moving on to customize. Well, it's the drive through window. Yeah. I, I <laughs> thought maybe I would use it to get a cheeseburger or something along that line, but uh, you can't get a cheeseburger here, can you? Well, I can. If you'll wait right here, I'm going to go through the front door and just run right over here to Hardy's and get you one. I'll be right back. <laughs> drive through window so convenient here. Yeah. Tell me about this. Well, being able to just hand off uh, supplies of contacts, uh, people coming through for, we have forms for kids who fail their screenings or patients are just needed to drop off for having me to fill out or, or for, uh, for me to, to hand back to them. I mean, this realistically, we will dispense glasses through this. We prefer you to come inside sure. Sure. Uh, because we want to be able to feel them on your face and adjust them as need be. But if you're in a hurry, Right here, here's your ticket. The walk the through window <laughs> or the drive through, whichever, yeah. way, whichever you like. <laughs> it's safer if you're in a vehicle and there's another one behind you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move to the front and finish up with this party that we've been having for the last few minutes. <laughs> And, Doc, we're, we're back to where we normally film like we did only one month ago, right. our regular program, and uh, right here in the lobby and uh, uh, right back to the front desk where the crew is. And uh, uh, I mean, a beautiful building. Thank you. A beautiful got a building. beautiful mortgage, too. <laughs> does that come monthly? It does. It does? And, yeah, I thought I, I made one payment they were done, but they apparently want me to keep doing that. 
Oh, my goodness gracious. Now, I bet you got more than <laughs> eight payments, too. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I was thinking. We appreciate you, you know, taking the time to show us the facility. Yeah. We appreciate you uh, uh, letting us come in and, and giving those folks who maybe not know who we are or what we do. Uh, or just, how we do it. For or how night. we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it. It's this much fun. I yes. can guarantee you that. Well, I hope it is. Doc, appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Merchants and Planners Bank was founded in 1946 by farmers and business owners because they needed a community bank that knew them and understood their business. A lot has changed since then, but Merchants and Planners Bank is still employee owned and operated and we're still committed to knowing and understanding the needs of every customer we serve. Great rates, fast turnarounds and experienced local bankers ready to work for you. That's why you should choose Merchants and Planners Bank. Stop at any of our 12 locations or contact us at mnpbank.com. Unity Health in Newport, we get to visit with Dr. Mark White once again, who we visited with a little bit about like a year ago. But uh, Dr. White, good to see you again, you sir. Too, sir. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. We're talking radiology. We're talking about mammograms. We're going to talk about a few of those things today, but kind of remind the folks a little bit about you, uh, uh, first of all, from a, a medical standpoint, and then talk a little bit about your family. Where'd you get started in this old business? Sure, yeah. I. I went to med school, graduated in 87, started my training in radiology in 88, finished in 92, moved back to Searcy. So I've been in Searcy since 92, practicing general diagnostic radiology. Uh, my wife's family and my family obviously are from there. We have a daughter that still lives there with two little boys. We have two other, uh, two boys that live out of town, two men right. out of town. and. Um, I've, I've been really acquainted with um, this medical community in the last five or six years because in 2015, I, th I think that was the year that Unity and Unity Health Harris became kind of a, a merger situation. And I was chief of staff that year, so right. I, I kind of developed a, you know, a place in my heart for uh, Newport and of course everybody that I work with here is just so nice and the patients are great to work with so I, I I'm here because I you know I want to see this place do well and get quality continue to get quality care for their patients and provide a good service for patients and referring doctors and that type of thing so well it's always good when you know you can ask somebody you know what brings you here and why are you here and then when you say things like that that uh, and you, you told me a while ago it it, it it means something to you it, it does in your heart to, it to, does. to be here it and does it. it's really a blessing um, I, I, to veer off onto myself <laughs> um, I'm at the best place in my career that I've ever been awesome. uh, you know a lot of people I'm 60 um, a lot of people burn out at different stages. Sure. Um, I, I'm, I just can't imagine quitting and right. I want to provide good service wherever I can so that's that's part of the reason for this outreach too if you will it's just to be able to interact with different people and provide services where I'm needed so it's really it's really a great time like I said I can't I cannot imagine quitting Right, I'm not right. ready. I'm not ready to. So well, you know, retirement you is a word, and, yeah. and, and 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 what and age is a number. So right, it, you work right. as long as you feel like working, That's and right. you're contributing and, and being a That's being right. a, a, a you know a, a a person who provides a great service. And there's no well, doubt you're doing that. Thank you. I'm trying. Right. Let's talk a little bit about, we're coming up, we're filming in September, we've got a program that's going to run September and October, and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Right. and uh, let's talk about what we do here at Unity in Newport, and, and, and I mean it's all about prevention, number one, but let's talk about what we do as far as the department goes here, the radiology department. Breast, breast centers or mammography centers typically um, will highlight their services in the month of October as you said, that's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There will be community outreach, marketing, those types of things. Women will be encouraged, in particular that month, to get their annual screening if they haven't already done so, 
or if they've gone for a time without getting a mammogram. So there's those types of things. Typically, you know, um, there will be other personal outreach type mm -hmm. programs that are instituted or, you know, will be uh, running during that month, uh, local advertising and other things like that. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of in-house, face-to-face outreach, but also community uh, outreach and, uh, you know, focusing on and coming together with, you know, in, in a sense with everybody else, for, um, you know, just in, in the sense that there's a, there's a united sense sure. of, of breast health during that month. I mean, there, you feel like you're uh, doing it with everybody else. So I think that kind of uh, beyond the community outreach is, puts everybody in mind of, uh, you know, how they should manage their health, particularly with regard to breast cancer awareness and those types of things. Uh, awareness is the big word, and, yeah. and, it, and it's not like that the, uh, that's the only time that we do these. Right. <laughs> we do them all the time, but it we, just... We do, and uh, this place and places that I work do a good job with um, um, advertising, marketing. Um, I mean, that sounds so cold. Right. Uh, you know, doing out is. doing outreach. Absolutely. Because um, you know, we feel like we're not we're not doing what we're supposed to do if we can't get the word out to to women that are you know at, at risk. Of course, screening mammography is done in a woman um, that is in uh, at risk. We at the time they done their screening, they don't have any complaints. Right. But because of the population and because we know that, you know, women as they progress in age, the incidence of breast cancer will increase. And I, you've probably seen lifetime risk of one in eight. Well, that's if a woman lives to be 80, 90 or whatever. But, you know, at each stage, um, you know, in uh, breast care, you know, there's an age group at which anybody even if they're not, you know, not having problems, sure. you know, should institute a screening process just so things can be uh, caught early and managed early. Because sure. that's how we like to, we don't like to see anything that's a breast cancer, but if we do, we like to find it at that curable stage. What recommend, uh, recommendation do you make for a, an age as far as, as people to begin, to start, to say, well, I need to go get my first one this time? Right. So typically what we do is we recommend a woman have her first screening mammogram by age 35. Okay. And then at the age of 40, we recommend annual screening mammograms. So that's just for the typical population, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for people to understand that we're doing these to, to try to find some early onset that could actually save somebody's life and it does time after time again. It does. Um, you know, it's reduced the percentage of deadly cancer, it's increased the um, the detection awareness and the ability to find things early. So there yeah, there's no doubt the data will will show that that catching things early and, and finding things before you would have otherwise known about them, you know, helps in the survivability of the disease. So we certainly uh, we expect you as good citizens to not only join us in October but join us when you would like to to have a mammogram. You can call us here at the hospital and get one scheduled or go through your primary care physician to, to get one scheduled and and uh, we welcome you back to Newport, Arkansas. And, well, I'm and, glad to be back, sir. Thank oh, you. I know you are, and yeah. uh, uh, excited to have you here, and you're such a great addition to the staff. Well, and, thank uh, you. Thank and, you. Uh, we appreciate what you do, my friend. Thank yeah, you, thank Dr. You. White. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the October edition of the Farmer Supply Association Agriculture Report. I'm Randy Klopetska, agronomist with Farmer Supply Association. Well, uh, just want to give a quick update on harvest. You know, we're taping on October the 14th. Uh, you know, it hadn't been the best harvest season I've ever seen. It hadn't been the worst harvest season I've ever seen. We've been getting some periodic rains that have kind of slowed us down. You know, we'll get a day or two good to cut, and then we'll get a couple days we can't cut, and uh, just kind of things have slowed down. and a little bit, but you know, I've seen worse than this. So, you know, we're making progress. 
I guess you could say we're headed in the right direction. Uh, talking about our yields, you know, we've talked the last couple of months about our rice yields being good, and they've held up pretty good. Uh, still hearing a lot of really good rice yields, uh, you know, several, you know, in excess of 200 bushels per acre, just a lot of good rice out there. One little hiccup I've uh, heard a little bit lately has been on the Jupiter variety of rice, and uh, I don't know what's going on with it. Jupiter's always been one of our more consistent yielders, but this year I'm hearing some, you know, spots here and there where Jupiter's not doing very good. Uh, I've heard some reports maybe the narrow brown leaf spot disease, which kind of has been a hiccup in some of our varieties over the last few years. So it may be that. Uh, not really sure if that's it or not, but you know, again, that is a concern because Jupiter has always been so consistent for us. But uh, again, not all the Jupiter fields have been bad, but I've been hearing some reports here and there of some low Jupiter yields. So that's really the only uh, you know negative thing I've heard. There, are, you know, are some wind storms that went through in spots here and there, you know, recently, and uh, so we've got some rice on the ground, and that slowed things down as well. But still, overall, a pretty good rice harvest. Uh, I think the milling yields have picked up some as we've got into this harvest. You know, they were pretty bad in places on certain varieties early, but you know, not as bad. Not a great, certainly not a milling yield like la yield like last year, but uh, still not too bad. Soybeans, uh, for the most part, really good yields with soybeans. Uh, we talked last month about some of these early planted soybeans on some of this good ground. They continue to just give some great yields. Hearing some great yield reports on some of these fields. You know, some of the other, uh, you know other production systems, maybe some average yields, but we're still really hearing some good uh, soybean yields where these guys plant early, have high fertility, and you're really pushing these yields, and we're still hearing some outstanding yields in those situations. So along that line, I think it's very important that if you're wanting to push your soybean yields, if you can get your ground prepared this fall, you know, for planting soybeans next year, I know some fields you just can't do it, they're not going to dry out, but if you've got the opportunity to get some of next year's soybean fields ready for planting right now in the fall. Go ahead and take advantage of that. That way you can plant early. Your chances of planting early next spring are better. And that'll, I mean, you're almost guaranteed your yield potential is gonna be better. You talk to any of these guys that are making great soybean yields, number one thing is always early planting day. So, you know, try to get there if you can. Corn yields, it's really good. A lot in excess of 200, so a great corn year. Heard some, you know, average yields early, but most of the corn I'm hearing is really good. So, yield-wise, it's been a very good harvest so far. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, is wheat production. Um, I didn't think we were going to have a lot of wheat in our area this year, but I keep getting calls the last couple of weeks. I've been, you know, getting several calls about wheat production. This field that uh, David's planting on right now is just planted Tuesday, so we've got you know quite a bit of wheat been planted over the last week to 10 days, and you know if we can keep it dry, wet, dry, I think we can get a pretty decent acreage of wheat planted this spring. Uh, economics is not real good this year. You know the input prices, fertilizer, seed, fuel are all way up, and that we thought that would hamper wheat acreage. The wheat price went down just a little bit also late summer, early spring, so uh, you know, or excuse me, late summer and early fall, so we thought that would hurt wheat acreage. But again, I'm still getting calls and we're still going to have a decent amount of wheat from those guys that normally plant wheat, I think. Just want to hit a few production items on wheat. Number one, planting date. We're taping again on October 14th and we're right in, in that perfect window. I like to see wheat planted between about the 10th of October and the 1st of November, so we're right in there. You know, you get later than that. You know, I've seen good wheat as late as Thanksgiving, but you really got to have a, a fairly mild, uh, you know, winter and, uh, and, and a good condition to get that crop tillering and off to a good early start. Otherwise, those yields start tr trending down when you get into those November plantings. So, again, try to get it planted the rest of this month. Seeding rate. Uh, seeding rate, probably that most of the research has shown about 26 seed per square foot. And uh, of course, that's going to vary your, to your rate depending on the seed size as far as pounds per acre. But you're getting that 80 to 90 pound per acre, that's going to be a uh, you know, pretty good seeding rate in most good situations. If you've got rough fields, you know, no tilling, uh, getting late, then I think you probably need to up that rate about you know, 10 to 20 percent over that. But otherwise, you know, 80 to 90 pounds dried is going to uh, uh, drilled is going to be a pretty good rate. As far as fall, fall fertilizer, again, we've talked about the fertilizer prices being an issue. So our guys are going to want to skimp on that. There's some places you can skimp, places you can't. Uh, nitrogen is a place that you can avoid the, the need for nitrogen, especially if you're planting in this normal time frame. 
Now, if you get late up in November, then you might start need to add a little bit of nitrogen to increase tillering. If you're planting wheat behind rice, we've got a little of that over in the Whitehall area and maybe a little more, I don't know, but that's mainly where we see that at. Then I think you probably need some fall nitrogen in that case, but otherwise you can skip the nitrogen. There's not much potash need for wheat. I mean, it needs some, but it doesn't need a lot. You know, if you've got a pretty decent level in your soil, you can get by without potash. Or, of course, if you're going to plant beans behind that wheat, you'll need to consider them and get that potash out there for the soybeans. But otherwise, don't worry that much about potash. But phosphorus is one thing that wheat really does like. So let's get those uh, you know, needed phosphorus uh, applications out there. I really think it's a good starter fertilizer to get your wheat off to a good start, even if you have some decent levels in the field. I would still like to see some phosphorus supplied out there. So, you know, probably get 40 to 50 units, you know, 100 pounds of triple superphosphates, 46 units. That's a pretty good fertilizer to get this wheat off to a good start with. Um, weed control, again, residual herbicides like other crops are very important. So if you've got uh, ryegrass issues in your wheat crop, like to see Zidua or Anthem Flex out there as a delayed pre-treatment. You really don't want to apply a pre-emerge. You want that seed to have sprouted before you put it out there. And once that seed is sprouted, you can make that delayed pre-emerge application of Zidua or Anthem Flex. And that'll give you good ryegrass control, good uh, bluegrass control, and several other uh, uh, weeds that are out there. So again, Zidua or Anthem Flex delayed pre-emerges. Finally, uh, fall residual herbicides, uh, you know, for guys that have got their ground ready to plant or are going to have it ready to plant, you know, get it ready this fall for next spring, especially in those situations. But there's other situations as well where I think a fall residual can pay off for you. Keep those winter weeds from coming up. Don't have all that vegetation out there next spring that you've got to try to take care of or, you know, the soil won't dry out good because you've got all that vegetation out there. So let's think about fall residuals, <clears throat> if that'll fit your program. If it does, then I think that's a good, good thing for you. As far as the broadleaf weeds out there, uh, you know, those fall winter broadleafs that we get, uh, Valor's one of the go-to materials. If you can apply some Valor out there, that'll uh, kind of keep those down and where you won't have an issue with those next spring. As far as timing on Valor, probably uh, if, if the ground gets real, if we get cool early, like we get a bunch of 60 degree temperatures maybe before the 25th of October, then I think you need to be looking at possibly getting that or, or getting that application of Valor out there about the October the 25th. If it stays warm till about the 1st of November, then wait till that first week of November to get that Valor out there. So that's kind of, don't put it out there too early. Again, about October 25th, uh, if it's really cool, otherwise wait till that first week of November and get that Valor out there. One other situation where residuals can help, and that's with ryegrass. And we see every spring, people have more ryegrass than they think, and they ask, what can we do with it? And there's not a lot of good options, because Roundup is, most of it's resistant to Roundup, or Roundup's not very good on it anyway, regardless. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to control uh, once you get it, get some size on it. So if we can keep it from coming up, that's a good way of handling it. If you're gonna be planting corn, milo, or soybeans next year, then uh, you've got several good options. Uh, Dual, Zidua, Anthem Flex, all of those are real good at, uh, on ryegrass. You know, get those out there, you know, between about, you know, after the 15th of October on into early November. Uh, get those materials out there and they'll do a good job for you if they get activated. And uh, we have a new, uh, uh, new material that we can use. It's not a new material, but something that has not been labeled for this use before, and that's Command. If you're gonna be planting rice next year and you're concerned about ryegrass, Command is a pretty good option right there. Uh, you can apply Command out there. The recommended rate is 24 ounces per acre, so that's a pretty good rate, you know, and so you really need to, need to have the need for that to use it. So don't be, you know, if you just got a little bit of ryegrass, maybe don't worry about it. But if you've got severe ryegrass infestations every year, you might want to consider that. Uh, on some of the real heavy soils, you know, that's not going to be an issue. You should be fine with that 24 ounce rate. Where there is some concern is on some of our lighter soils, our silt loam soils, especially uh, in Poinsett Cross County and some of Eastern Jackson County where we have these high pH uh, soils, these silt loam soils, sometimes that uh, high rate of command could be an issue. So uh, I think the, the company FMC is doing a little research. They're talking about this and see you know, what the recommendation are to be. They really want to get that rate lowered if they can you know, to a lower rate than that 24 ounces because, you know, sometimes you get these, uh, get these rates a little too high on some of this, uh, you know, thin silt loam soils, it can cause some issues. So 
Uh, again, if you're applying it on uh, heavy soil, I think you're fine. If you're going to apply it on the silt loam soils, uh, then you may call me and we're going to see what the company is going to come up with on this. Again, they're still tossing around some ideas and seeing if they can get that changed. So uh, stay in touch with me if you want to try that, uh, the command on the uh, on these lighter, on these uh, silt loam soils that are high pH. If you're going to do that, well, let's talk about it before you do it. So uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, if you have questions on any of this, you can contact me through Farmer Supply Association. And this has been Randy Klopetska with your October edition of the Farmer Supply uh, Agri Report. Community Bank Newport, uh, the Greyhound Report with Mr. Brett Bunch, who joins us, the superintendent of the Newport High School, and uh, uh, we operate with mask, Mr. Bunch, because that's part of the protocol. Yes, sir. We uh, made a decision back in August when school was getting ready to start to, to use masks to reevaluate after 30 days. That was uh, We did that Tuesday night at our board meeting, uh, and really what we had said is if our community, if our county is in red, which is there's too many cases, mm -hmm. then we're going to continue the mask. If it's in green, then they become optional. And so the board, we had a long discussion Tuesday night, long discussion, and uh, the board voted to continue that same protocol. And so we're still in mask. And uh, if you look at information that's sent out by the legislative uh, research board, then they actually sent it out to us and I forwarded on to our uh, board members and it shows that schools that have masks are seeing less cases and having less quarantines and so we found out some stuff from some parents Tuesday night that's been taking place that that really shouldn't uh, you know wearing masks during PE that's not optimal and so we've, we've made those changes to correct some of that stuff uh, none of us are perfect <laughs> we just continue to try and, and do what we can to protect our kids well, the thing that we're doing is is we're trying to get an education. That's what we're there for. We're there to get an education. And so the learning process has continued. Uh, we go through last year, which was just a tremendous different type of year. And, and even this year is not 100% back to what we call a normal. And who knows, will it ever get back to a normal? But we're still having good education at the Newport School System. We are. And our, last year we ended uh, the school year with 1,049 students. We had lost a lot of students. Uh, this year, we're at 1,132. Wow. If you add our pre-K in, we're over 1,200. So it's, it's really, we've seen that back in person need. Uh, we realize that, that virtual is good for some things, uh, but for an overall education, it's not. You've got to have that face-to-face -face interaction, and it's critical for our kids. And so we're very blessed to, to have teachers that, go into the classroom every day and teach and work with those kids. And they wear so many different hats that uh, we're just so thankful to, to have the staff we have from our teachers to our IAs to our, you know, our custodians, our maintenance, our bus drivers, uh, our administration. You know, we've got new administration this year with at the high school with John Bradley as the, the principal and we added uh, Brandon Gates as our assistant principal. That's going great. And then over to elementary, we added Misty Bergen as our Dean of Students, and that's going great. So we've really been blessed with, with the people we have working with us. Yeah, and I'm really more familiar with high school, and you, talk about, and you add Coach Benny Reynolds in as the Dean of Students up there. I, I, mean, I mean, a pretty good administrative group that, uh, I mean, from the strength factor, uh, I think a very solid group, as good as we've ever had. Well, I, and I was very happy that, that those gentlemen applied, that we were able to fill those positions with, with you know, greyhounds, and uh, to be able to put godly men in right. those positions that, that have values and ethics and, and the morals that, that we are looking for, to transfer that into our kids. Because, you know, we're more than just educators in a classroom. We're more than just giving them that inside information and uh, teaching that foundational knowledge because our teachers and our administrators wear so many different hats from, you know, pastor, of course, Brandon is one, but uh, from pastor to, you know, uh, counselor to sometimes uh, even 
stepping in the role as as a parent. Sure, and absolutely. Him. And so we're we're just blessed to have that and having a good year. Uh, we've had some some bouts of COVID and we've had to quarantine some, had to cancel some ball games. But the reality of it is is that when you look at the education that's taking place, last year we put an academic uh, compliance counselor in place, and <clears throat> it's been in place for you know, through the last semester and the first start of this semester. So five weeks in, we have 254 kids that are involved in athletics and extracurriculars. Right. And we are tracking all of those, and that's seventh grade through 12th. And out of those 254 kids, we have 71 of those that have a 4.0. Wow. Awesome. And taking on all of everything else, and over 120 that have a 3.0 to a 3.99. So the overall GPA of those 254 kids is right at a 3.53. Wow. Which is, is great because, you know, we said this year that going forward, period, we're looking at academic accountability. Right. And we want our kids to be prepared to go out into the community and across our state and across our nation and around the world and be able to compete with anybody. I've said this, and I told a lot of people, you know, around the state of Arkansas, or anybody would ever ask me when they when we're talking schools, and I'm talking about our school, my school, your school, our school, New Fort High School. That the, it's a great place to get an education. Uh, and when I talk about our kids, and Mr. Bunch of all the kids, and I talk to a lots of kids. If it's nothing else, just saying, hey, how's it going today? Good to see you, boy. Really appreciate you. Never, ever one time, whether it would be a girls basketball player, a golfer, somebody on the tennis team, uh, the volleyball team, the football team, the basketball team, and I, the, 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 uh, uh, the ROTC uh, bunch, the rifle team, every time I've ever asked a yes or no question, every single time I've got a yes, sir, or a no, sir. Not one time can I remember that one of those kids didn't say that. We, and that speaks volumes for what we're doing. We do. We do. We have very respectful kids. We have great kids. I mean, the image for a while has been that, that we were uh, just letting kids run wild, that we weren't educating them. And, you know, those grades come out each year by a standardized test. Right. Uh, and one thing that I've told the board and, and everyone, I'm not going to teach to the test because that does not do kids any any good for their future. We're gonna educate our kids. And if they can take a good test, great. If they can't, okay too. But the reality is, can they take the skills from that classroom and from our school and go out and make a decent living and have a family and do things that they're supposed to to be good citizens of our community? Maybe the most impressive thing I've heard from an educator since I've been living to tell you the truth because that's what it's all about what you learn in that classroom can you take that and make yourself a productive citizen that's that's pretty good stuff right there and it's critical because think about the reality of it is the kids we are educating today will be taking care of us that's right in several years and so we want them to go out and have that opportunity we want them to get the most out of their education that they can and i think our kids are starting to realize that they can be successful in the classroom, that they can be better than they think, that they're be, some are being told they're not. And so our challenge is, is continue that academic accountability, make it possible for our kids to go out and earn a good living and be good citizens, be taxpayers so that we can continue to educate their kids. No better place to go to school than Newport, Arkansas, and I don't care what anybody says about anything or anybody about our school. Uh, there's no better place. And we'll, I want to end with this. I want to ask you about your health. How's Brett Bunch health-wise? Well, as you can see, I, I, I haven't been pushing away from the table much, but uh, doing well. I'm doing good. well. You know, it, it's going good. I had that heart attack last year and had to work through all that, but have had so much support from the community, from my staff, from kids. Uh, and, and, again, I'm just blessed beyond words to be able to do what I'm doing and to continue to work to do what's best for kids. That's Mr. Brett Bunch. He is the head hound, the superintendent of the Newport uh, Public School System, the Newport Special School District. We appreciate you taking time, as always, to join us Thanks, on sir. the First Community Bank uh, uh, Greyhound Report. Thank you, Mr. Bunch. Thank you, sir. And go hounds.
Alicia Gates from uh, St. Michael's Place in Newport joins us to talk about uh, all the great things going on at St. Michael's Place. And we'll kind of introduce you. Everybody in Newport, Arkansas, Jackson County knows you. But uh, tell us a little bit about Felicia Gates and tell us a little bit about your family before we get going. Okay. Well, I, we live, my family and I live out at Elgin. Um, we have for like four years now. Um, I am married. We have four kids. We have all of the animals and our, our roots are deep. Deep here in yes. Jackson County for sure, no doubt yes. about that. And uh, uh, let, let's get into talking about St. Michael's Place. And of okay. course, we're a long term or short care facility. Yes. Uh, tell us about what your job title is and tell us a little bit about the you know job description and a sure. day to day. What, what, what do you do here? Sure. So I am the business office manager. Okay. So any money that comes into the facility, whether it be for trust for the residents or their payments for their for their stay here, okay. their families all bring that to me. I'm in control of their their trust accounts. Um, so all the money, that's all me. All You're the, the insurance, money lady. that's all me. Yep, and so I, I deal with all of that. And so admissions, um, all the payer source issue, issues, that's all me. I take care of all of that for our admissions. Tell me a little bit about uh, being here and then not being here and then being here. So, <laughs> yeah, so I um, a few years ago, I worked here as the business office manager unforeseen circumstances I left and I got the opportunity to come back thank you April and <laughs> <laughs> and you know we've always talked about how St. Michael's Place feels like home and it does it really does we love the people we love the house we love everything about it it just there's something about these walls <laughs> it just feels like home so I'm glad to be back and I plan on my, my goal is to become the administrator here and just take over from where April leaves off so well and to do that and, and you talk about that and you've got some training AIT training and yes. talk a little bit about what that is and what all that entails and what it takes to become an administrator so there there's a certain set of requirements of course that you have to meet before you can get into AIT into the program and once I'm in which I've finally met all those I I will start at the beginning of next year okay. and there's some meetings in Little Rock once or twice a month that okay. I'll have to go to and then in between times I'll be here and it's more on the job training it's actually like better I like I like right. that I'll get to be in the job I have to work in dietary to learn dietary I'll have to be in laundry to learn laundry and I have to know what these people do so that I can I can direct accordingly and awesome responsibility I mean it's an it's awesome huge. responsibility <laughs> number one to, to uh, uh, have the heart to work in a facility yes. Uh, yes. that, that takes care of, of people that are just have, you know struggling and, and yes. hardly can take care of themselves and then uh, that's on the long-term care but to, it takes special people to work here and y'all got a special group yes. talk about the group as a whole so we have a really great group so um, our CNAs of course are you know I think the backbone and then you know everybody the housekeeping laundry um, nurses are amazing and then our department heads, we have a great group of department heads. So like our medical records and Corey is our DON and she just took on that role not that long ago and she is amazing at it. And we have a great HR manager and we just hired a new social worker. I think you talked to her. Um, so she's amazing. And we're, we're just, we're in a really good spot and I like it. For a long time, and what we've, we've done these interviews for quite a while, we've always talked about the team and the, mm -hmm. to assemble a good team and to have a good team. Yes. And it, it all, you know, it all starts at the very top. And, and April has just been absolutely awesome. And then mm -hmm. she has to assemble what she thinks is her best group, and yes. and, and you've been assembled yes. with this group. And so, I mean, y'all have a great group here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, lots of. Uh, Kind of talk about what's the difference between short-term care and long-term care. Kind of explain that to me. So short-term is just, you know, you go to the hospital and maybe you lose some muscle mass or you, um, you know, you fall at home and you just, you need some more rehab than what the hospital, you know, the hospital will give you some, some inpatient rehab, but then maybe you need more past the hospital. So that's what we're here for. So you come here and you stay for a short while um, and we get you back to the way you were so okay. that you can return home without as much help and maybe be back to where you were before whatever happened. And then long-term care is obviously... Yes, long-term care is you come live with us, yes. That's great. That's, that's yes. generally for the duration, but uh, yes. uh, I, I know I, I like to come in here. I, I, I know we had a tremendous upgrade facilities not too long ago, several years ago, but uh, 
uh, it's just a good place to come. It's a it's a happy place to it come. Is. It it's is. A it's a happy, happy place. Here. The right. residents seem happy, and I yes. know if the staff is happy, the residents are happy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You guys That's have got it go, got it going on for sure. Yes. I know that. And uh, Felicia, we appreciate you taking time to join us. And, and uh, just on Absolutely. a side note, I wasn't going to mention this, but uh, we did this interview last week, and for some reason <laughs> we had to do it again. And uh, it wasn't any part of St. Michael's the reason we had to do it again. Sometimes we just don't turn on a microphone. And boy, I know this. We were doing a lot of. <laughs> and I couldn't get anything out Maybe of it. Maybe we can get that bad lip reading thing going. <laughs> there you go. I appreciate you so much for Absolutely. doing it again with us. Absolutely. Felicia Gates, we're at St. Michael's Place. We're in Newport Pecan Street for short term or long term care. Think about us. Good morning and welcome to Becky Mitchum, who is a speech and language pathologist at White River Health System uh, in Batesville, Arkansas, in Florida today and get an interview. And why in the world would anybody go, well, what does the violin or the fiddle have anything to do with what we do? And it's interesting what we have. Becky, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, let's find out a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background, your education, and your specialty of speech pathology. Uh, I studied at a conservatory of music first. Being a speech language pathologist is what we call my encore career. So I was with the Arkansas Symphony for about 28 years. I started the string program at Lyon College in Batesville. Um, and then Barbara Reeves really is who took it and ran with it because I just play the violin. She also plays, you know, cello and viola and really got the whole string program started and someone else has the program now. But anyway, um, I am now a speech language pathologist and the overlap is, you know, we, you talk about music is an international language. Sure. And so um, music and language in the brain, actually, there are some overlaps. And so we can use music and elements of music to help support language processes. And so I just really have always been fascinated in language. Um, I speak two languages, German and English. But what's always fascinated me is that like you can go travel to different countries, this sounds stupid, but you'll see little children and they're completely fluent in a language I'm struggling to learn. Um, it's just like, it's what you hear, you absorb. And these children in China that are fluent in Chinese and in Germany, are, they're fluent in German. And so this is, um, and I'm kind of hopping around here, but the Suzuki, okay. the Suzuki method is called the mother tongue method because children learn to play the violin the same way they learn their mother tongue by listening. So much later, children, associate a symbol system with the music, which is note reading, just like with language. You don't sit a child down and hand them a book and expect them to read. They first listen and learn to speak and then read. But anyway, um, so I just, it's the language component of speech language pathology that got me interested in this career that I'm in now. But I love all the ways that music plays, in, plays into it. Well, let me ask you, we talk about speech pathologists, speech pathology, and, and uh, you know, people hear that term all the time, but they may not know just exactly what you do. What do you do and who do you treat? So speech pathologists can treat across the lifespan from the cradle to the grave. And we work on um, assessing problems. We can treat, you know, assessing, diagnosing, prevention, lots of patient education on what I call cognitive linguistic barriers. So anything to do with speech production, which is the articulation of speech, so speech sounds, but then also language, which are the choices of the words you use. And then the cognitive component is how you put the words together. Um, and just all those higher level thinking processes, how do you, can you predict, can you infer, 
And then the social component, how do you apply your language knowledge in a, in, when you're communicating with others? Do you know how to take turns? Do you know how to stay on topic? Do you know how to contribute to a conversation? Is your partner uh, extremely dependent? Uh, is the person carrying the conversation for you because you can't? I mean, all of those are social components and then also feeding and swallowing. So we do a lot of things that are, a lot of people think we only work on things like stuttering. Right. Um, or you, you've heard, you know, people that have a list where they may, they may talk like this, where it's a, a lateral list or a frontal list like this. Um, and, but it, speech pathology is so much bigger than that. But those are, those are issues of fluency and articulation definitely are within our scope of practice, but so much more. And also uh, voice. So I get a lot of patients um, at White River with um, voice issues. So it could be something like vocal nodules or polyps on your vocal cords, but it could also be, um, I see a lot of this too, muscle tension dysphonia. So tension settles differently in all of us. On me, it's my right shoulder blade and also I get it in my larynx. And so we work a lot on teaching people how to breathe efficiently, how to better coordinate exhaling with speech. And we were anyway, there's just so much, so much that speech pathologists can do. Yeah, you mentioned the Suzuki method. Kind of kind of elaborate on that. What what is the Suzuki method and how does that work? Yeah, sorry. Like I said, I hop around. That's um, okay. The Suzuki method, it's named after um, not a motorcycle. <laughs> it's named after <laughs> uh, Shinichi Suzuki, a Japanese gentleman who was a, a fine violinist. And he uh, created this, it's really very brilliant pedagogy for learning. Started with the violin, now there's the Suzuki for piano, guitar, uh, harp, I think too, but it started on violin. And so the, 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 the idea is listen to a melody. You listen, 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 and then you reproduce it on the violin. And so uh, you start with beautiful tone, you start with posture. He put this all together in a really nice framework called the Suzuki method. Mm -hmm. And they make violins. This one is a full size violin. This is very old. This is about 185 years old. It's a French violin. Wow. Um, but they make them like the size of my husband's shoe that, you know, little violins for little people and, <laughs> and, and little bows, right? So this is my big full size bow. Um, so, and they make little guitars for little children too. So, you know, and then as the child grows, of course, the instrument gets bigger with them uh, as their skills increase too. So, but it is a brilliant, brilliant way to teach. Um, the one flaw in Suzuki, and it's, it's only a flaw if the teacher doesn't correct it, is if you only focus on, re on listening and playing by ear, you'll never learn to read notes. And the Suzuki method is all about listening and absorbing and playing by ear first. But if the teacher never teaches the child to also read notes, you're really doing them a, a huge disservice. It's, it's, it's being basically musically illiterate. We know there are adults who never learn to read our language and you can imagine how, what a, hand, a handicap that is. Um, so it's the same, I feel, whether you play in an orchestra or not, it would be nice, learn to read the notes, then you can do both. Then you can play by ear and you can play in an ensemble, whether it's in a group at church or in an orchestra or whatever. So that's the one thing that a lot of, um, I had a student at Lyon College then that was so good. She auditioned and, and I called the symphony and I said, we have somebody here in Batesville who is good enough, I think she can. She could be an alternative if we ever needed to call in an extra, she's that good. And then she got to her first lesson and she couldn't read, a, she couldn't read one note. 
So it was, it was I, I felt sad for her, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's the Suzuki method. And if you, um, if you follow it correctly, it's brilliant. Each piece has skills embedded in it that build on for the next. And that's what language is too. We build on what we know. Really, isn't that all knowledge? Math, everything is sure. higher. So Suzuki put it all together. There are 10 Suzuki books. Um, the first four really set the groundwork for being a good violinist. And the rest, uh, the remaining books are basically the repertoire applying all of those skills. But it's brilliant. He, he, was, he, had, he knew nothing about uh, language acquisition and he got it so right. He got it so right. Applying those same principles to music. Brilliant. When we put it all together, when we talk about uh, uh, White River Health System and, and, and doing what you do at, uh, at, at uh, Batesville, how do you get in touch with you? How do people reach out to you to get more information or to see you if somebody's having an issue, whether it be an adult or a, an adult who has children? How do we get in touch with you to, to, to come see you? So I'm at the Pros Clinic on Harrison, which is right next to Casey's convenience store, kitty corner from the hospital. You can call the clinic, which is 870-262-1271. And either Cindy or Sherry in the office, um, they know my schedule. They can pull up the calendar and they, you first have to get a referral from a physician. Um, the speech pathologists won't see you unless you have a physician saying, there's an issue with this or that. And then um, and there's some fine pediatricians in Batesville if, if it's a child. Um, but otherwise, like if you have a voice issue, go to your ENT. There's some also great ENTs in Batesville. So get a you get a script first and then you can call the clinic and they'll take it from there. Becky, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to end this interview with just a few more notes on, first of all, tell everybody the difference between a violin and a fiddle. That's what I, I did right, not know so, what I had to ask. <laughs> so on a violin, these are called strings. On a fiddle, they're called strings. <laughs> Let's end it with some good music that'll help in speech pathology. Becky Mitchum, we thank you so very, very much for joining us on a beautiful, beautiful morning in Newport, Arkansas, Baseball, Arkansas. It's about 65, 68 degrees here. And uh, I know you in Florida and uh, we wish you the best and looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much.